so greetings to you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, put the slides up maybe, and uh, we'll start there. So thank you again for the invitation to come. Thank you for Pastor P.Y. Philip uh, inviting me to come and Dr. Minu for making the introduction. It is really a pleasure uh, for me to be here and to share some from my own life and from the Word of God on how uh, he calls us to be his disciple. Um, I'm especially thankful that uh, my two boys have joined me. Uh, Vivek is number two, uh, my second son. So he's over there, you can wa wave your hand. And Vivek is 15, and uh, uh, I'm glad he's here. And if you see any beads of sweat on my face, um, I had him drive from Dallas up to here. And so it's all because of that, not because I'm nervous, okay? No, actually, he did an amazing job. He's a great driver, so we thought that would be a good way for him to get some driving hours. And so he drove me from Dallas to here. He was my chauffeur uh, up to Oklahoma City. And then my third son, Micah, is here. You can wave, Micah. Yeah, so he's also here. And uh, so two of my boys are here, and my wife has the hard job of taking care of the other eight kids that are at home. So you can be in prayer for her because she probably needs a lot more prayer than I do up here. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to come and speak. And, uh, you know, as I was praying through what should I share with you, um, I was really praying and as the, leading the, asking the Holy Spirit to lead me. And really what the Lord was impressing on my heart was really a call to suffer. Um, I titled the message, The Call to Suffer. And, you know, with a title like that, you're probably never going to invite me back here again, right? <laughs> because, you know, you said, this man is going to come and he's going to make us very depressed and very sad about our life. Uh, but I think part of our problem in modern day Christianity is that we think that when you become a believer and you follow Jesus, the life will be full of blessings, that material possessions, happiness, all these things will just go right uh, because we follow Jesus. But that's actually not true at all. In fact, the call to Christ and the call to follow him is a call to take up your cross and to suffer with him. So I want to begin with a couple of verses that I think will kind of introduce us to this topic and then some lessons that I've learned from the Lord on this topic. In Luke 14, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with you. Luke 14, uh, verses 26 and 27 and 33, Jesus says this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Wow, Jesus is asking us a lot, right? He says that if you want to follow me, pick up your cross and follow me. If you want to follow me, give up everything for my name's sake. In Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, it says this. They were walking along the road, and a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of heaven. Wow, these are tough things to digest, right? When we're told that a life with the Lord means a life of blessing, and what he's saying is that if you follow after him, you will lose everything that's valuable to you. You give up everything for the sake of following after him. With that, let me begin. Let's have a word of prayer before we start. Heavenly Father, I just pray that as we read through your scripture and we share some of, Lord, how you worked in my own life, that, Father, we would count the cost. And we would see, Lord, that following after you, uh, even though it, must, it might cost us our lives, our families, our comforts, Father, it is worth it because, Lord, you alone are worthy. And we pray that as we read through these scriptures, I pray that your spirit would work in the hearts and minds of the people that are here, Lord, that they would see uh, what a joy it is to follow after you, even if it costs us our life. And we thank you for this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. I'll begin with this first thought, that is that following Christ means a life of suffering. It's not an easy thing to digest, right? To be able to say that to fall after Jesus really means you're embracing a life of suffering. What does that mean? 
I'll tell you a little bit about my own story and how I ended up in India, and uh, perhaps that will give you some idea of what exactly the Lord asks us to do when he asks us to follow him. So as uh, Dr. Binu, uh, Dr. Minu said, um, I came to the U.S., as many of you, I came as a young boy. I was 10. My family came with my two sisters, and uh, we followed the American dream, like many of you, right? We came here because there was the opportunity for a good education, and uh, by the Lord's grace, um, I did well in my school. Uh, but as I started growing and growing in my faith, especially in high school, I felt very clearly the Lord was calling me, and calling me not just to an ordinary life, but a life to follow after Him. And I kept wondering, what exactly does that mean? How does that mean for me to follow after Him? And as I prayed and spent time in the Word, it became very clear that it was God was calling me to missions, and specifically as a medical missionary, I had some good mentors that had discipled me, and uh, I had a love for the sciences, and as I read the scriptures, I saw so often how the Lord would often use a time of healing, a physical healing, and then through that, teach his personal principles. So, for example, when the man comes in that can't walk, right, he heals him, but before he heals him, right, he forgives him of his sins, right? And when the one that comes that's blind, he heals him, and then there's a spiritual principle that's behind it. And so I saw that over and over in Scripture, God so often uses physical healing as a way for us to teach somebody about spiritual truth. And I saw, wow, what an amazing way for me to be able to use my life, right? Here I can, I can meet people's physical needs, but through that, have the opportunity to talk about spiritual things. And I, saw, I thought, the Lord is calling me to missions, and specifically as a medical missionary. So I uh, finished my undergraduate at Texas A&M, and uh, I got married to my wife, Melissa, uh, which you'll see a picture of later. And uh, after I finished, uh, after, after I got married, um, I got accepted to the Mayo Clinic, uh, which is probably the most competitive hospital in the entire world. And uh, it was just an amazing blessing that the Lord allowed me to go there and, and get my training. And then after that, I went on to do my residency at Southwestern uh, in Dallas. And all along this time, we had been praying and thinking about, Lord, how is it that you're going to call us to missions? And our heart was always in India and seeing how can we get ourselves ready to go and so after I finished my training, I became an assistant professor at Southwestern University. And then after that, uh, within about a year after I finished, I became the medical director of the hospital that I worked at. And uh, we decided that it was the time. The time was right for us to leave. And uh, I talked to my family. A lot of, I have many uncles and aunts that live in, uh, in the Dallas area, a lot of my colleagues. And uh, when I told them that I was going to leave this behind, um, they just thought, wow, what a foolish decision, right? Here, you've achieved the American dream, right? You've gotten educated at some of the best places in the country. You have a wife. At that point, I had three children. And uh, you have a, a wonderful job. You're already the director of a hospital. And then why in the world would you leave all this? And why would you? It doesn't make any sense, right? From a worldly sense, none of this made any sense, right? I had achieved what everyone said. This was the Indian dream, right? The dream is to be able to come and be here, get an education, and have a good career, and I achieved all those things, and then I'm saying to the, all of them, I'm ready to leave, and none of it made any sense, but we felt very clearly the Lord was convicting us, and we knew that there were so many that were lost in India, and specifically in the northern part of India, which is where we're talking about it, the Ebenezer International Mission, right? So many in the north don't have access to the gospel, and we thought, what an amazing way for people to have access to the gospel through medicine, right? When people are sick, they come to the hospital, and we have an opportunity to minister to them, and not only minister to them physically, but also spiritually, and we said, no, that's where the need is, not here in the U.S., and so we decided to move our family and, and move back to India. So um, to kind of show you a little bit about where we were, that little A up on the top is where we were located. We were located in a small um, town on the border of Indian Nepal, a little city called Raksal, and we specifically speak, uh, we spoke or we chose to go to this particular state in India called Bihar, and the reason why we chose to go to Bihar is because it's one of the most least evangelized states in India. So about a half a percent of the people that live in Bihar are Christians. And along with that, it's a huge population. About 126 million people live within the state of Bihar. So lots of people and very few people that know the Lord. And what we found is that having a hospital there provides us a platform to be able to get the gospel to those that never would hear who Jesus was, right? Many people would never come to a gospel meeting, but when somebody in their family is very sick, they need somebody to help. And even if it's a Christian hospital, they'll come and bring them there because they know that at least they'll get good medical care. And so they'd bring them there. And then when they came and they received care and they saw what people, Christians, look like, right? How do they love patients? They had a glimpse of who Jesus was. And so that's really the, really the reason why we decided to join at this particular place in Bihar. 
And uh, what we particularly noticed as we prayed and talked to people around India, we found that you know, Bihar has always been known as a graveyard of missions in India. You know, people would come, labor there for decades, and would see very little fruit. But over the last 20 years, that's changed. Many more people have come, and their response to the gospel was great. And so we felt this is really what the Spirit is moving within India, and that's, that's where uh, the Lord had called us to, and that's where we decided to go. And so we decided to join a hospital called the Duncan Hospital. And the Duncan Hospital was actually started as by a Scottish missionary who wanted to go to Nepal, but Nepal was a closed country, right? It was a Hindu nation, so they wouldn't allow any missionaries to come. And so he said and said, well, if I can't go to the Nepalis, I'll build a hospital on the Indian border so the Nepalis can come across the border and get health care, and through that have access to the gospel and take the gospel back to the villages of Nepal, which is how Duncan Hospital came to be. So... Um, Duncan Hospital serves as a secondary referral center. That means that we take in patients from other hospitals in the area because we can do some things that most of the hospitals in the area couldn't do, mainly intensive care work as far as people on the ventilator. And so we essentially served as the only hospital for about a six to eight hour region around us, which means about 11 million people would use our hospital as their primary place to get critical care services, meaning people when they're really sick and they need help, they would end up coming to the hospital. And once we joined the staff there, you know, my wife and kids were there. My wife homeschooled all three of our children. And uh, as we ministered there, we saw very clearly the Lord was at work. And I wanted to share a couple stories with you that I think would help to illustrate what the Lord was doing there. So this man that I'm going to show you on the picture up here, his name is Birju. And I met Birju uh, when he came to the emergency department. And in India, they call it the casualty department. So um, I take care of patients in the emergency department, and then I take care of them in the, in the intensive care unit. Those are kind of my two areas of responsibility. And so one of my junior doctors had seen this man, and it was a very common presentation because uh, pesticides are very common in our area. So depression is very high in the community. Lots of people are very sad about things that are happening in their life. There's lots of poverty. And oftentimes when they feel very overwhelmed, oftentimes the only thing they know, is, know to do is to end their life. And so this man came like many of our patients, right? He had... Um, if you look at his face, you can see that the left part of his face is burnt because about 10 years before, he had a bad chemical injury, so the entire left part of his face was burnt off. And so he used to work as a, um, as a, as a shop seller in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the open air market in uh, his city in Nepal. And uh, that's what he would do for a living, but somehow some things had happened in his family's life, and so they lost most of their money, and he felt like he had no hope, and so when he felt that he had nothing else left to live for, he decided to find a bottle of pesticide, which is very common there, and decided to drink it down. So he comes to the emergency department, and he's on death's door, right? He, uh, when you take this pesticide, your lungs fill up with fluid, you can't breathe, and his oxygen level is about 60% when he got there. Normally, it's like 95 to 100%, right? So he comes in. I see the classic signs of what we call organophosphate poisoning, and so I give him medications, and soon enough, his lungs clear up, and he looks better. And I admit him to the ICU, I put him on a ventilator, and then about 24 hours later, I, kick, I take him off the ventilator, he looks good. And because the family was very poor, uh, they said, hey, hey, Dr. G, you know, we know you want us to keep him in the ICU, but we're really poor, we can't afford to be in the ICU. Can you please send us to the medical ward, and we'll watch him there, and as long as he does okay in a couple of days, we can send him home. I was very uncomfortable with that decision, but I said, well, that's your decision, so sure, let's get you back in the medical ward. So I discharge him from the ICU, he goes to the medical ward, and that's by me about 10 o'clock in the morning. And then uh, I usually come back in the evenings to do evening rounds. So usually I see the patients in the morning, and then again I see them again about 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And then about 4 p.m. that afternoon, I had a very s clear call from the Spirit. And the Spirit was telling me, you need to go back up to the hospital, and you need to go back to the medical ward to check on one of your patients. And I said, Lord, that doesn't make any sense. I never round at 4 p.m. I always round at 8. That's what I normally do, because otherwise I mess up my schedule for the rest of the day. But the Spirit's calling was very clear, and he said, no, you need to go up there, and you need to go at 4 p.m. I didn't want to not you know, say no to the Spirit, so I said, okay, I'll go up there. And uh, I get up to the ward, and uh, back in the corner of the ward, there's this man, and this is what he looked like when he got there. So you can see he's breathing, but he's barely conscious. Stuff is coming out of his nose because all the toxins that he had taken had come back into his system. And he was, again, symptomatic from the poisoning. And because there's so few nurses in our wards, nobody recognized he was getting really sick. And so I get up there. I check his oxygen level. It's, again, at 60%. He's barely alive. I immediately shift him back to the ICU. I put him back on a ventilator. And then 24 hours later, we kind of wean him off. Looks better. Family makes the same request. They said, hey, we can't stay in the ICU. We need to have you send him to the ward. And I said, look, you already had a really bad event that happened. I don't think it's a good idea. They said, no, 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 really. We need to have him go to the ward. I said, okay. Goes back to the ward. And then a couple of nights goes by, and then one of my colleagues, who's a pediatrician, and, you know, 
you know about adult and pediatric medicine. Pediatricians never want to see adults, right? They only want to see kids. And so he's doing rounds on the pediatric ward. And then, but for some reason, he also felt a sense of the spirit. And he said, for some reason, he decided to go by the adult ward. And when he goes up there, he sees this man, same condition, completely comatose. He is full of secretions. He's barely breathing. He intubates him, puts him back in the ICU. And he comes back. I see him in the morning. And I said to him, Burju, I'm not letting you go. I don't care how much it costs. We'll cover the cost, but we're going to keep you in the ICU until you get better. So it takes him about two weeks. And he finally gets out of the ICU. And uh, you know, whenever we've had a patient that we've taken care of for a long time, we often throw them a party for the day they leave. And uh, so this is the day that he leaves the hospital. And uh, we threw a little celebration for him. Can you turn the volume up? There you go. So that's that man that now should have died three times, right? The first time he came to the casualty, the second time when I decided to go check on him at 4 p.m. when I shouldn't have, and the third time the pediatrician that wasn't supposed to be there went and checked on him. Three times he had almost died, and here he's now alive and praising God for the fact that God has given him a chance at life. So I talked to Baiju, or Birju, and uh, right before he left, I said, Birju, you know, you're a very lucky man right? And not just lucky, there's something that God is doing in your life. He said, you know, you came here to die, and three times you almost died, but somehow the Lord knew and sent the right people just at the right time when we shouldn't have been there, and because of that, you're here, and you're getting to go walk out of the hospital. And then he said something to me that was really profound. He said, um, Dr. G, I don't remember much of what happened when I came to the hospital, he said, I came in the back of a Tonga. The Tonga is like a horse-drawn carriage. And I remember I was going in and out of consciousness when I came to the hospital. But I remember as I came to the hospital, I looked above the building, and I saw a man clothed in white robes. And I wondered the entire time that I was here, who was this man that was standing in these white robes about the hospital? And he said, I kept wondering that over and over again, in and out of the ICU, I wonder, who is this man that was standing there waiting for me in front of the hospital? And he said, one of your nurses has been reading the Bible with me, and he's been showing me passages in the Bible. And this man is a Hindu. He's never actually heard the name of Jesus. I mean, he lives in a very remote community, has no access to the gospel. So this is the first time he's ever hearing about Jesus. He said, as I was reading through these verses in the Bible the nurse was telling me about, I realized that the man that I saw standing above the building was Jesus. I said, what did you say? And I said, you know, how is it that this man, he said, you know, I came here to die right? But the Lord found me here, and he saw me. And because of that now, I have a chance not only at this life, but the next life as well, right? What a testimony, right? What a testimony to see that God is powerful, and he's working in ways that we could never imagine if only we're obedient to his call and willing to listen to him when he calls us. So we continue to minister there, and, you know, I love the work there. I had lots of patients that I had multiple miraculous things that didn't make any sense to me. You know, as an as, as a American-trained physician, you know, lots of things we think about in the scientific world, and there are so many stories of people that there's no way this person should have survived, but yet we pray for them, and the Lord brings healing in ways that I could never explain. And uh, so I want to share a couple more stories with you um, to kind of tell you a little bit about this hospital and what the Lord was doing there. <clears throat> You turn up the sound. हमको विश्वास विश्वास नहीं थे हम कि हम चल पाएंगे हम खराब पाएंगे हमको बिस्तर पर से गोद उठाकर ब्रश कराती थी चेयर पर बैठाकर खाना खिलाती थी मम्मी कभी नहीं कभी हम सोच रहे थे हम हम कब मर जाए हमको नहीं चलने आते हैं बैंकन हॉस्पिटल के मैंने धन्यवाद करता हूँ सभी सभी स्टाफ को सर को दीदी लोग को धन्यवाद करता हूँ क्योंकि मैंने सोच रहा था मैं बिस्तर पर से कभी नहीं उठ पाऊँगी कि यहाँ पर आए तो हमको यहाँ पर आए तो हमको नजा जीवन मिल गया फिर से मैंने सब कुछ कर सकता हूँ दिल से मैं दिल से कहती हूँ कि मतलब आज जो भी है मेरा बेटा हॉस्पिटल यहाँ डॉक्टर के नर्स नर्स लोग के वजह से और डॉक्टर कृष्णू के वजह से मैं तो ये हमेशा याद रखूँगी इस जन्म में तो हमेशा याद रखूँगी कि मेरा बेटा का दूसरा रूप 
बहुत अच्छा और ये डंकन के पूरे स्टाफ लोग पूरे मतलब जितने हैं लोग सब कोई बहुत ज्यादा और मेरा बेटी एक गुड्डी है और ये तीन साल के थी तो ट्रेन से इसका स्टेंट हुआ था और उसके दैना हाथ और बाएं पैर इसका कट गया था वहाँ पर और वहाँ से गांव के गांव वाला लोग उसको उठा कर लाए और हम लोग लेकर इसको गांव वाला लोग और इसके पापा ने मिलकर डंकन में ले गए इसको भरना की आठ दिन डंकन में रह गए और आठ दिन के बाद जब हम लोग आपस आ, आ रहे थे तो उस यहाँ पर प्रभु सर ने हमको बताया जे यहाँ पर सी बी आर हैं और ऐसे ऐसे बच्चों को मदद करते हैं तो वहाँ पर ले जाइए वो सर ने बताया हम लोग गए ले गए तो भैया लोग से बात हुआ हम ऐसे ऐसे बच्चों के लिए हम सोचते हैं जो हमारे भी बेटी जैसे बढ़े या कि मैं उसी सबको बच्चे बढ़े और उसके लिए हम सहायता करें हम मदद करें जैसे भी हो के I thank God for giving Duncan in my life, and thank God for the professors I have got here, what they have done in my life, both spiritually and uh, professionally also. Here I have gathered many stories, many stories of the patients, so that I'll carry to the rest of my life, so that I can tell to the patients wherever I can what the God of Duncan did, and what He can do for you also. So I can, as you can see, the Lord did amazing things, things that I caught, thought would never happen. The Lord not only allowed us to be able to take care of patients, uh, but I was able to train a lot of young staff to be able to teach them what it meant to follow Jesus, to be able to give their whole life to him, and to be able to follow him wherever he called. And, you know, and that was our plan. Our plan was that this is where we would serve for the rest of our life. That's where God had called me to, was really go back to India and to be able to use medicine as a way for me to be able to serve Jesus and build a care for physical needs. And that was my plan, and that's what we thought would happen. But the Lord had different plans. Following Christ, as Jesus promised us, will cost you everything. As Dr. Minu briefly alluded to, um, I teach for the CMDA, which is the Christian Medical and Dental Association. And so I go every year to Willie Teach at this international conference. And so in April of 2016, I left India with my family uh, to, to go teach at this conference like I'd done many times before. And on the way out, uh, my wife and children went through, no problems, and then they scanned my passport, and all of a sudden I noticed that the screen turns red, which I'd never seen before. And then all of a sudden, the immigration official starts asking me lots of questions. What are you doing here? Where do you live? Who do you work for? How long are you planning on being here? So I said, look, I work as a doctor. I work in the emergency department in ICU. My family's lived here for three years, and this is where our home is. So lots of questions, questions they never asked me before. And at the end of it, he left me with this cryptic message, and he said, if I were you, I would never return to this country again. And I said, what do you mean? Right, this is where my home is. This is my family. I moved my entire life here, my whole career. Everything is here. What do you mean? He said, I can't give you any more explanation, but if I were you, I would never come back to this country again. So with those words, I left India. And uh, over the next three weeks while I was at this conference, we wept and we prayed and asked, Lord, what are you telling us? Right? We get this cryptic message. I don't understand what this means. None of this seems to go according to plan because everything you had been doing with us in India, it seems like the Lord, you were blessing it. And yet now, all of a sudden, I'm being told by this man that I should never come back. So we said, well, the only way to know for sure what exactly this means is for us to return and to see what happens. So after much prayer, lots of people around the world were praying for us. Um, we decided to return back to India at the end of April in 2016. And I knew that my wife and kids were fine, so I let them go through first because I knew they wouldn't have any issues in immigration. So they cleared immigration just fine in New Delhi. And then I go into the immigration official, and I give him my passport. 
and he scans it, and immediately that red screen comes up. This time, it's not just him. Now he calls his supervisor, his manager, three different immigration officials come by, and they said, what are you doing back here again? You were warned never to come back. And I said, well, this is my home. This is where I live. And they said, no, you're no longer welcome in this country. You have an hour to leave. And I said, what do you mean? This is what I had spent so much of my life investing in, planning for, praying through, and now you're telling me that I have, a leave, I have an hour to leave this country that I call my home. And they said, I can't give you any more explanation. The embassy in Houston has issued for your deportation, and you're no longer welcome here. You're on a blacklist. And so then at this point now, four other uh, police officers surround me. I get separated from my family. I see my uh, wife with uh, my uh, three kids. They're there crying because I'm separated now from them. And I'm wondering, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? What are you asking us to do? So I get taken into custody in Delhi, and uh, <clears throat> they actually keep the flight that had landed from Turkey. They keep it waiting because they won't let it leave until they put me back on the plane. So then the officers escort me back onto the plane, and as I get onto the plane, and the plane is taking off, I have no idea what's going to happen to me. I remember as the plane takes off, I look down the window, and I see my homeland disappearing from behind me, and I wonder, Lord, what are you asking me to do? Right? This is where my home was. This is where my life was. And now all of a sudden, I'm wondering if I ever, ever see this homeland again because of what just happened. And then as I remember on that flight, I had many questions. You know, up till that time in my life, I always knew where home was, right? When I lived in India, I knew my home was there. When I came to the U.S. with my family, my home was here. When I moved my family back to India, my home was in Bihar. But this was the first time in my life when I realized I had no home. I didn't know where I was going to sleep that night. I didn't know where I was going to go. I had, you know, all these plans about what my future was going to look like. And all of a sudden, everything gets taken away. And I have no clue what's going to happen. And, you know, as I sat there and I remember looking out the window and I looked at Delhi passing behind me and I remember just weeping before the Lord and asked, Lord, what is it that you're asking us to do? And do you know what he brought to me was this passage from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 35 through 40. It says this, there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so they might, they, so that they only together with us would be made perfect. And then Hebrews chapter 11, verses 11, 13 and 16 says this, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly home. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. And that was the thought that Lord Park put in my mind, is that he was making it very clear, this is not my home. Right? India was not my home. The U.S. was not my home. Where my family was not my home. My home was a different one because I belong to a different country. And that's what I'm looking forward to. And that was my assurance as I left India. As I got onto the airport and then we flew onto Turkey, I want to give you a second part that the Lord taught me. And the lesson that he taught me is that suffering is how God gives us more of himself. Suffering is how God gives us more of himself. What do I mean by that? I landed in Turkey, and I thought my ordeal was done. Uh, because I said, you know, I'm a U.S. citizen. I had an OCI card to go back to India. And so I, I knew that in Turkey, you have visa on arrivals. So that means I show my passport, and I get a visa to be able to enter in the tur into Turkey. And my plan was that as soon as I got to the airport, I would get out. I'd get a ticket. I'd fly to Nepal, because I knew that Nepal was right close to uh, where we lived in Bihar. And I'd wait there for my family to figure out what we should do. So that was my plan. Actually, in fact, on the airplane, I had actually bought tickets from there to fly to Kathmandu. And so we land in Turkey in Istanbul, and uh, I'm re getting ready to leave. And then the air hostess stops me and says, no, you can't leave the airplane. And I said, why? He said, no, you have to wait here until the Turkish authorities and the policemen from the Turkish authorities come into the airport to escort you. And I said, 
but that's not fair. You know, I'm a U.S. citizen. I have a passport. And he said, no, it doesn't matter. You're being deported. You have to go back to where you came from. And because we had started this trip from Spain, they said, we have to send you back there. You're not allowed to leave the plane unless you go in with the, uh, the Turkish authorities. So two officers come onto the plane. They escort me from there in the plane, and they take me to a detention cell in the middle of the airport in Istanbul. And uh, <clears throat> that was probably one of the most scariest and loneliest times of my life. I remember going into the cell, and then the prison doors closing behind me, and then around me there's 20, 25 other men that are all being detained, waiting to see what will happen to them. And I remember at that time I felt so alone, so forgotten, right? And I asked God, I said, Lord, I did everything you asked me to do. I followed you where you wanted me to go, and this is what I get. Right? I sit in this prison cell. I have no idea where my family is. I have no idea what my future is. I have no idea where my home is. And here I am, all alone, by myself. I feel so distant from you. But you know, when you go through our greatest suffering, that is when God shows himself to be the most real. And you know, the worst that he brought to my mind was from Psalm 139. This is David writing. He says this in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. He says this, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my depths, my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you and the night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. There in my moment of being most alone, most betrayed, most, uh, most forgotten, God was reminding me there was nowhere that I could go that would be away from his presence. He was telling me that even in the depths of my despair, even when I felt so alone, his presence was right there. He had never left me, and he would be with me, right? That was the promise. And I don't think I would have ever understood what that meant, what these verses ever meant, if I had never been in that position where I felt so alone and I felt I had nobody to turn to except the Spirit of the Lord to come and minister to me and say, look, even here, when you think that everyone in the world has forgotten you, my presence is here, and that is sufficient. First Peter 5.10 says this, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Psalm 34.18 says this, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. In 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 16 and 18, it says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not what is seen, but on what is unseen, since that what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The English preacher Charles Spurgeon wrote this about suffering. He said this, it is a blessed thing that when we are most downcast, then we are most lifted up by the consolations of the Spirit. One reason is trials make more room for consolation. Great hearts can only be made by great troubles. The spade of trouble digs the reservoir of comfort deeper and makes more room for consolation. God comes into our hearts, he finds it full, and he begins to break our comforts and to make it empty, then there's more room for grace. The humbler the man is, the more comfort he'll always have because he'll be more fitted to receive it. Another reason why we are often happiest in our troubles is this, is then we have the closest dealings with God. Right? He knew what that meant. He knew that only in trouble and tribulation, when we feel most alone, that's only when we have the room to be able to feel God's consolation, to be able to feel his presence in our lives. A third thing to remember as we face the cost of following Jesus is that we suffer because Jesus is worthy. We suffer because Jesus is worthy. I want to share with you a story, and the story is of a missionary named Dr. Helen Rosevier. Dr. Helen Rosevier was born in 1925. She grew up in Belfast, in Northern Ireland. All of her life, she had a motto. The motto she did followed faithfully and was in the form of a question. It was this, is it worth it? Before she went out on a date with a guy, she would ask, is it worth it? 
Before she bought a book, she would ask, is it worth it? Before she took a course at the university, she would ask, is it worth it? By asking this question about everything in her life, she became a disciplined, well-trained woman physician. She gave her heart to the Lord during her time at Cambridge University and then did her university training at the hospital. After finishing her training, she went to the Belgian Congo to serve among lepers in a place called Nibongo. There, she cared for patients with leprosy, served women in the maternity ward, did surgery, took care of children in the pediatric ward, taught nurses, and she lived and served in this community for many years. She loved the people of the Congo, and she made it her life's work to serve them with Christ's love. Then in 1964, after 11 years of selfless service to the people of the Congo, the Simba uprising happened. The Simba rebels came in. They took her from her bungalow, and they tied her to a treat and beat her. Then one at a time, two different soldiers took turns raping her. The first soldier took her from that tree, took her back to the bungalow, and raped her in her own bed. He brought her back out, and the second soldier took her the second time and did it again. One of them, while they were searching her room, found the only manuscript of a book that she had been writing for 11 years about the Lord's work in Africa. They brought that out and put it in front of her on the ground and burned it. And as she saw that book going up in smoke, tied to that tree, her body violated, humiliated, she said that same question. Is it worth it? Is it really worth it? 11 years of my life poured out for the African people, and this is what I get. Then she said, over that awful scene, God's spirit came down, and God began to speak to me, and he said to me this, Helen, my daughter, you've been asking the wrong question all your life. Helen, the question is not, is it worth it? The question is, am I worthy? The question is, am I worthy for you to be going through what are you going through right now? Am I worthy for you to be beaten and raped and humiliated for my sake? She said she looked up at the face of the Lord Jesus and said, yes, it is worth it because thou art worthy. That was the same question that came before me. Lord, is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to be treated like a criminal for your name's sake? Is it worth it for me to lose my home, my job, my career for your name's sake? Is it worth it for me not to see my wife and children for your name's sake? Is it worth it for me to live a life of uncertainty for your name's sake? Is it worth it for me to have spent 18 years of my life following your leading to India and then have seemed to lost it all for your name's sake? And the answer was resoundingly, yes, it is worth it, because Lord, you are worthy. First Peter 6, 1 Peter 6 and 7 says this, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even, through refine, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honor, when Jesus Christ is revealed, right? That's why we go through trials, is so that the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed in our lives. When people look at us, they see not us, but they see who Jesus is. And because we do that, we do that to, build, to, build a glory, bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. Finally, we suffer because suffering is a soil on which the kingdom of God grows. Suffering is a soil on which the kingdom of God grows. Very truly, I tell you this, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it provides many seeds, and anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. A call to follow Jesus is a call to die. A call to give up your life for the sake of the kingdom so that many more might know to come, him as, come to know him as Lord. The second century church father Tertullian wrote this, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. What does that mean? It means that suffering is a necessary part of how the Lord brings about radical change. 
Suffering is how the Lord brings about the gospel to those that will never hear it. Suffering is part of God's plan to make his name known through the ages. So what was this greater purpose God had called us to? After we got back to the United States, um, it was in May of June, in 2016, um, we started a process in which we uh, filed a case against the Indian government challenging the grounds of my deportation. And then in June of 2016, I remember sitting down with our lawyers. I couldn't go back to India, so it was all done on uh, phone calls. And they sent me some papers, and I signed everything so that the lawyers could file the papers on my behalf. And I remember taking those papers up to the, to the, to the mailbox and asking the Lord, Lord, what is it that you're asking me to do? And uh, this was the paper I held in my hand. It says this, in the high court of Delhi at New, of, of Delhi, at New Delhi, Dr. Christopher Phillip versus the Union of India. Right. I remember looking at that and I think, like, Lord, what are you asking me to do? Here I am, this tiny little person challenging a government of 1.4 billion people. Where is this ever going to go? This is all seems so foolish to even try to attempt this. But the Lord was clear. Lord was making it very clear to us that this is the path he wanted us to. He wanted us to be able to challenge the reason why I was deported from India. So that started our process, which took then three years. We went to court over and over again. And each time, I would file papers in the U.S. They would send it to India, and the lawyers would then speak on my behalf. And every time they'd go, the government would never tell anything more. They just kept saying, no, nothing can be disclosed. And finally, after a year and a half, um, they said, why can you disclose any information about why you deported this man from the, the country? And they said, well, he's considered, of high, he's considered a national security threat to India. And because of that, all the charges against him are classified. So I said, well, it's really hard for me to argue against things that I don't even know what I'm charged with. But that was their excuse. They said, no, he's a national security threat. So because of that, nothing against him. Uh, we can't tell it out in public because then that would be a national security problem. So we kept going back to, we asked the Lord, you know, and you know, hundreds if not thousands of people all across India, the U.S., and around the world have been praying for us and praying for this particular decision. And we kept praying. We kept going back to the court asking, Lord, give us justice. And then finally... A Hindu judge, of all the people, you know, the Delhi High Court is composed of uh, a, a series of different judges. There are some Christian judges on there, uh, very few. The vast majority are Hindu. And a H Hindu judge picked up our case, and he was the one listening to it. And then he told the government, he said to the Indian government, he said, well, if you can't disclose the charges against him, at least let me see what the charges are and what the evidence is, and I'll evaluate to see if there's actually grounds for him to get kicked out of the country. So the court, or the Indian government had no option but to be able to give him whatever documents they had against me. So he read through the case, and he said, we'll make a decision. And then in January 2019, he issued the verdict. And this is what it said. It is clear from the plain language of Article 25 of the Indian Constitution that all persons are equally entitled to freedom of conscience and have the right to profess, practice, and propagate religion. Article 25 is not restricted to citizens of this country, but is available to all persons. Thus, the petitioner has a right to practice his faith and his rendering medical service, even if it is for the furtherance of his religions, cannot be denied. The respondents have produced no law that prescribes missionary activities, and the impugned orders which proceed on the assumption that such activities are against the law of the land are fundamental. The impugned orders are set aside. The respondents are directed to forthwith restore the petitioner's OCI card, and the respondents are further directed to ensure that there is no impediment to the petitioner entering this country. What an amazing thing, right? Here's this Hindu man writing to say that all people in India have the right to profess, practice their religion, right? And so, of course, the newspapers pick it up. We get it all over the Times of India. All the, case, all the major uh, papers in India end up picking up the case because it was a fairly important decision because up till now, there has never been any constitutional law regarding freedom of religion within the Indian Constitution. And... You know, I remember when that case finally got decided, I remember getting calls from hundreds of people across India saying, brother, I'm so glad you got deported because it was so important for the people of India to know that they had freedoms that were guaranteed in the Constitution. And up till now, we lived in freedom or we lived in fear because we didn't know what would happen. But here, the high court is telling us, no, because you're an Indian citizen, you have these rights and that rights belong to everybody here. You have the right to practice your religion. You have the right to be able to propagate it. You're able to tell others about who you are and who you believe in. And that's not against the law. 
And so for so many people, it was a reaffirmation that they could practice and profess their faith and then had to live in fear because the government, there was laws that would protect them. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. When I was in India, I had encouraged many believers in the South to come to the North. I'd spoken at multiple conferences, encouraged them, come, come to the North. That's where the need is. That's where the gospel needs to go. Don't just stay in your safe areas where you feel like, you know, you can practice your faith and freedom and uh, you can hang out with people that know Jesus. Instead, come to the North where there's so many that have never heard the name of Jesus. And as I spoke to one of these conferences, um, a young man and his family heard my call, and he called me up and he said, hey, I want to come. Can I come work in this place that you're at so that I can plant a church? And I said, Brother Baiju, come on up. We'd be happy to have you come up here. And he did. In 2015, he came up there to to join the work that we were part of, and he planted a church. And so then when I finally got the ability to go back to India in 2020, this was that church that I met with. And you can see now there's about 40 people that are gathering in this home and now in 2025 or 2024, there's five of the churches that have been planted in that area because this man followed the leading of the Lord to be able to come and work in North India. And indeed, that's what the Lord said, right? Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it only remains a single seed. It was necessary. It was important that I had to go through what I had to go through so that the gospel could spread, so that there would be opportunities for the gospel to come to the north and so that people would come to faith. So this is us at uh, a service with them in last January. So because of the work that was being done there, because people were called to come and work and leave their comforts, because of that, a church was planted there. And because of that, now there's five churches that are planted and people have access to the gospel. So what's my challenge to you? My challenge to you is this. Following Christ means a life of suffering. It will cost you everything. Your job, your comfort, your health, and maybe even your life. Suffering is how God gives us more of himself. Suffering is a normative part of the Christian life and what he uses to sanctify us and draw us closer to him. Matthew 5, 11 to 12 says this, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. The times that you feel close to the Lord is oftentimes in your greatest suffering. We suffer because Jesus is worthy. There is no other name, no other cause that's worth more than to suffer for the name of Jesus because there's no other name that is worthy. It is only the name of Jesus Christ that is worth giving our lives for. It's the only thing that will count for eternity and that is to be able to give your life to the Lord because that's the only thing that's gonna last. And finally, suffering is a soil on which God builds his kingdom. James 1, 2, and 3 says this, Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Suffering is a soil on which God builds his kingdom. Count it all joy when you suffer, because that's how the Lord uses you to build and expand his kingdom. So as you think about Ebenezer International Ministries and what they represent, right? These are people that have given up their lives, right? They've given up their comforts for the sake of the gospel, right? Some of you, the call tonight is going to be for you to take up that call and to say, look, I'm willing to leave the comforts of home. I'm leave, willing to leave the opportunities afforded to me because I know there's a greater cause. And the greater cause is that people need to know the Lord Jesus. And that the people that need to know the Lord Jesus is my own countrymen. And some of you need to leave here tonight with that conviction and that call that says, Lord, you're calling me back to be able to take the message of the gospel. And some of you, maybe that's not your call. Your call is instead to be able to support those that are serving in that part. But then when God calls you to do that, he calls you to do that sacrificially, right? If you give something, but it costs you nothing, right? That doesn't mean much. But when you give out of a sacrificial heart, when it costs you some suffering to be able to give to the work the Lord is doing, then I think that's something that's a worthwhile sacrifice to the Lord. That's the rest of my family. So for those of you who want to know what the rest of my kids are, so it's my wife and my other 10 kids. 
Um, but I am so glad for the opportunity to come and minister to you guys and to be able to share a little bit from the word. And really, that is the call for each of us, right? Jesus tells us, take up your cross and follow me, right? That cross is not easy. In fact, it's an extremely difficult one. But when you follow and you walk in step with the master, you will find that you will enjoy his presence. You will enjoy fellowship with him. And that is the greatest blessing of being able to follow the Lord is to be able to enjoy his presence. Let me close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the high cost of discipleship, Lord. That when you ask us to follow you, you call us to leave everything. Lord, our comforts, our families, our desires, our wants, Lord, we ask us to leave all those for the sake of the call. And the call, Lord, is to follow after you because, Lord, you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy of our sacrifice. You alone are worthy of worship. I just pray, Lord, that you would use your spirit to work each of our hearts, Lord, to see what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to follow you? And I pray that we wouldn't shy away from that call because, Father, you alone are worthy. And it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.